I'm interested this morning in just a portion of a verse in the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse number 3. The Old Testament book of 1 Samuel chapter number 20 and verse number 3. I want you to look at the last phrase in that verse. Uh, verse 3 of 1 Samuel chapter number 20. I'll say a little bit more tonight in the message about David and where he is when he makes this statement to Jonathan. But I want you to look at the phrase in that last part of verse number three. There is but a step between me and death. There are many passages in God's word that confront us with the reality of death as far as our individual lives are concerned. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, it's appointed unto man once to die. Time and again, we are reminded of the fact that we are human beings and outside the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, Every one of us are going to experience an hour when these bodies that have housed us, tabernacled us, are going to die. Would you pray with me and we'll look at some thoughts. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here in this place on this Sunday morning. I, I think about where we are this morning and how different it is from any other time in our life. Though many of us have been in this building time and again on Sunday morning and Sunday night, we've never been here just like we are this morning. This is a new day. Uh, we are facing new opportunities and new challenges and new responsibilities in our lives. And yet as we've looked into your word this morning, we face a reality that is as old as the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and they began to die. Help me this morning, Lord. My desire is to be a blessing in this place, and I ask you to help me this morning. I pray for that one who may be struggling spiritually in their life this morning, whether they're unsaved and need to trust Christ, or whether they're saved now the will of God. Would you bring the reality of the truth that we're looking at to their hearts and help them to say yes to you. And we'll praise you, Father, for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. David says here to Jonathan, There is but a step between me and death. Here is a truth that most of us do our very best to keep pushed out of the forefront of our minds. We don't want to be confronted with it. I know people who will not even go to the funeral home when somebody dies because they don't want to see the reality of death. But it is a, it is a reality that not one of us in this room can ignore. Not one of us in this room outside the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will escape our appointment with death. David tells us here that death is just a step away from us. Death is only a faint heartbeat away. Put your, put your hand right up there. You may or may not be able to feel it. If you're fluffy like I am, it may not, you may not be able to feel it real well. But you feel the beat of that heart. Huh? Just one beat of that heart is all you are away from death. Whether you're young or whether you're old, there's only a step, only a heartbeat between you and death. Unless you're a part of that foolish category of people who don't believe in God or uh, the hereafter, then you believe that this morning. Now, I didn't call you foolish. The Word of God's already done that. Twice in the book of Psalms, Chapter 14 and verse 1, and again in Psalms 53 and verse 1, God said, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. 
I didn't call, I didn't call that person a fool. God did. And, and the reality is that that's where they are. Only a fool would make a statement like that. There is no God and there is no hereafter. There is but a step between us and death. It is a truth that is applicable for every one of us in this building this morning. But not only is it applicable for every one of us, but there are probably some of us this morning that it is more applicable to than others. I've been thinking about this verse. It's been on my mind for several weeks uh, since I heard and, and read the, the, the story of the, the terrible tragedy of that, that vehicle that was owned by a company called Ocean Craft that uh, was taking the rope down to uh, look at uh, the ruins of the famed Titanic ship back in June. Five men set out on that voyage. One of them was CEO of that company. The other four had paid $250,000 apiece to get in that small uh, submarine to go down and look at the wreckage of the Titanic. Evidently, I, I don't know that they've ever discovered exactly what happened, but evidently there was a, a serious flaw in the vehicle. I understand as I've read that it had not been tested adequately, and I, I don't know who in the world would ever get on something like that if it hadn't been tested adequately, but they did. And, 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 but evidently there was a very serious flaw. I heard one man say that if a... If a hole came in that thing smaller than the size of a pinhole, it would that quickly cause an implosion. And that's exactly what happened. When in a few minutes from the time that they had set out on that voyage, contact was lost with the vehicle. And several days went by. In fact, about an entire week went by before the sad news finally came that they had, they had spotted uh, uh, some pieces of the wreckage down near uh, the wreckage of the Titanic. Uh, part of the hull was there. I read just a few days ago that all they found of the remains of those five men who were on that uh, vehicle were finger parts that were still inside the hull uh, of that, uh, that ocean craft laying on the ocean floor. Along with the vessel that they were in, their bodies being exposed quicker than my hands came together like that this morning to the tremendous pressure of ocean water at that depth and uh, their bodies along with that vessel imploded that quickly. Quicker than you can blink your eye, quicker than you can even think, all that took place and they were in eternity. Those men experienced the reality of David's statement here in, in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse number 3. There is but a step between me and death. The reality of that illustration and the truth that the, of David's statement here ought to cause every God-called preacher to get into pulpit on this Sunday morning and preach as a dying man to dying men. It ought to stir the heart of every child of God to be a witness to their lost loved ones and their lost friends. This may very well be the last sermon I'll ever preach. I cannot promise you this morning that beyond a shadow of a doubt that I will ever come to this pulpit again. This could be the last sermon that I'll ever preach. But even more serious than that to you, this could be the last sermon that you'll ever hear preached this morning. There is a step between me and death. Betty Still and Shin wrote a poem entitled, Five Minutes After I Die. Five minutes after I die, loved ones will weep o'er my silent face. Dear ones will clasp me in sad embrace. Shadows and darkness will fill the place five minutes after I die. Faces that sorrow I will not see. Voices that murmur will not reach me. But where, oh where, will my spirit be five minutes after I die? Not to repair the good I lack. Fixed to the goal of my chosen track. No room to repent. No turning back five minutes after I die. 
mated forever with my chosen throng, long as eternity, oh so long. Then woe is me if my soul be wrong five minutes after I die. Contrary to what atheists and humanists and materialists and communists believe, there are only two possibilities as far as the soul of man is concerned five minutes after they die. And those two possibilities are these. It is heaven or it is hell. And I want us to consider those two possibilities in the message this morning and again this evening. We'll talk about hell this morning for a few moments and then with the Lord's help we'll come back and talk about heaven this, e this evening. May I remind you this morning that five minutes after you die you could be in hell. You see, if you die outside the Lord Jesus Christ, before your body is cold in a morgue somewhere, you'll be present in an eternal hell without the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I know that there are those who mock and scoff and, and, and laugh at the very thought of hell. But I can tell you, those who died this morning are not laughing at that truth. They know it to be a reality. I don't enjoy preaching on the subject of hell. I'd much rather go to John chapter 3 and verse 16 and preach on the love of God. I'd much rather preach on by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'd much rather preach on those things than I had to come to a subject like this this morning. I will tell you there is nothing more physically and more spiritually exhausting for a preacher than to try to preach on the subject of hell. But you see, if I'm to be honest with the God who called me, and if I'm to be honest with the Bible that I'm reading from this morning, and if I'm to be faithful to those who sit in a building and hear me preach the Word of God, then I must warn men of this horrible truth that's found in the Word of God. Sadly, we're living in a time when this word hell has become nothing really more than a byword in our vernacular. In fact, uh, it, it has slipped out of the church today and you, you about have to go to the entertainment media to even find the word used anymore. It's, it's become commonplace to hear the word used in a very careless and a very flippant way. Who, who do you think is behind the whole idea of belittling the idea of hell. I can tell you who it is. It is the devil himself. Because he knows that if people ever come to a place that they see the reality of the matter of hell and eternity in that place, that, that, uh, uh, that they're going to seek a Savior. If they never see that, then they have no reason to desire to be saved. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4, in whom the God of this world, talking about Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Please listen, with all the firmer that I can muster up this morning, I must tell you this morning, there is a hell, a, a place that's real, in fact more real than where you and I are uh, right here this morning. And it makes no difference what the so-called scholars say or, or the politicians say or the so-called theologians say. It makes no difference what the musicians may sing. It makes no difference uh, how the teachers of this world may deny the fact of hell. It does not change the Word of God. 1 Peter 1 and verse 25 says, The Word of the Lord endure forever. And this is the Word which by the gospel is preached unto you. People have always scoffed when the Word of God comes to the matter of judgment. Do you know why? Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 5 says, Evil men understand not judgment, but they that seek the Lord understandeth all things. I don't have any doubt this morning that if the Congress of the United States or even the Supreme Court of the United States could vote on it, 
They would outlaw hell as being cruel and unusual punishment. Men scoffed at hell when God said to Noah that he would destroy the world by a flood. And yet in Genesis 7 and verse 22, the Bible says, All in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in dry land died. All the mocking, all the laughing, all the unbelief did not keep the flood from coming. Men scoffed at Lot. I, I can hear them as they laughed at Lot as he tried uh, to warn his family about uh, the coming fire and brimstone that God was going to burn up the cities of Sodom and, and Gomorrah. They laughed at him. They, they, they scorned him. And yet the Bible says in Genesis 19 and verse 24, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. You see, all their scoffing, and all their laughing did not keep the fire from, from falling. Men even laughed and scoffed at Daniel the prophet when he warned them that, that, that the Medes and the Persians were coming uh, to, to overcome Babylon, that God was sending judgment. And yet Daniel 5 and verse 30 says, In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. All their scoffing, all their mocking, their laughing did not keep God's judgment from coming. Let me say again this morning, beloved, there is a hell. There is a hell. What is hell going to be like? Will it be like some of the comedians make it to be? What is hell going to be like? You, you can go and, and, and to the bookstore and, and, and browse and... And you'll find books written about hell and, and, and you'll find all kinds of things being said about this terrible place called hell. But I want to tell you, the one place, the only place I know to consult is the Word of God to find out what hell is really going to be like. Let me mention several things this morning about this awful place called hell. You might want to jot them down. They're here. They'll be easy for you to jot down in your Bible, somewhere in the fly leaf of your Bible this morning. What hell is going to be like? First of all, could I remind you that hell will be a place of vile and wicked associations? I don't know about you. I... I uh, Miss Janet and I are probably living in the last house we'll ever live in in this world. I have no plans of selling and moving anywhere. But if I were going to, and I know we've had some folks here and I've had some good friends who are selling houses. House prices are way up and folks selling houses, getting money out. The only problem with that is you've got to buy again if you're going to buy a house and the, and, the, and the buying prices are up. But I promise you, when you start looking for a place to live, you're not going to, you're not going to go to the lower section of the city as far as class and, and environment is concerned to buy a home. You don't want to live there. Well, I can tell you this morning, hell's going to be one of those places that it'll be filled with vile and wicked people. It won't be a few here and a few there and some over yonder. All you will ever find in hell will be those who are vile and wicked. Listen to what Revelation 21 and verse 8 says. He gives us a roll call here of those who are going to be in hell. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You want to know who your companions are going to be in hell? There's a roll call. There the Word of God gives us insight into the character and the life uh, the, the makeup of the individuals who are going to be there. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I certainly would not pick that kind of a neighborhood to live in if I could. Somebody said, but preacher, I'll read that. I'm not as bad as those people are. But would you, would you, look, would you look at who is at the head of the list? The further you read in that list, the, wor the worse it gets from our standpoint. But, but look at the first two that he mentions here. But the fearful and unbelieving. You, you see, beloved, there is no greater sin than the sin of unbelief. In fact, it is the sin of unbelief that will send a soul to hell. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 10 says, He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Unbelief is the cardinal sin. 
out of which all other sins are born and come into existence. An unbelief of God and a belief of facing God. As a result of that, all other sins come to pass. Along with the list that John gives us in Revelation 20 and verse 8. If that were not bad enough, then the Bible tells us that Satan himself will be there. No, the devil's not in hell yet. But he's going to be. Jesus tells us in Matthew 25 and verse 41 that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Yes, that's right. Hell was not made for man. God did not create hell for man. God created earth for man to live in. And on God created the Garden of Eden for man to live in and to enjoy. But you know the story. You know how Satan came and tempted Adam and Eve and they, they fell right into the trap and disobeyed God. And so as a result, they find themselves condemned to this place that God initially created and prepared for Satan and his angels. Revelation 20 and verse 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. By the way, let, let me just tell you this morning, when, when the devil arrives there, he's not going to arrive there as the big dude in charge. Satan is not going to hell to be in charge. He'll not be there running around with a pitchfork making people shovel coal like some of these cartoonists try to picture the devil as being. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of heaven and earth and hell beneath always has been, always will. He's the Lord of lords and King of kings. But I can tell you if you go to hell, remember this, not only are you going to find all that wicked crowd from Revelation uh, chapter 21 there, but you're going to find the devil himself. And then along with Satan, every demon spirit is going to be there. 2 Peter 2 and verse 4 says, If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness. And the last part of that verse says, To be reserved unto judgment. Those angels that rebelled with Lucifer and were cast out of heaven delivered and delivered into chains of darkness are going to have their eternal place in that place called hell. But then along with the uh, demons and, and Satan and all those vile people in Revelation 21 and verse 8, the unsaved of all the ages are going to be in hell. The Hitlers and the Stalins, all the terrorists from all, the, all time, the Ted uh, Bungie, Bungies and, and all the murderers of all time, the most hideous, the most awful people, the most vile people that you ever think of are going to be in that place called hell. Though, though God never prepared this awful place for men, if, he, if man refuses to trust Christ as his Savior, he's going to wind up in that place. Ungodly people of every rank and file are going to be there. The fearful... And the unbelieving, the abominable, that word abominable means detestable. Murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers. That comes from the word where we get our word druggist from, pharmakia. What he's talking about there is the drug dealers, the poisoners, those, those that are poisoning our society today, especially with all this mess coming across our southern border. Idolaters, those who are involved in idol worship. Oh, no, I'm not talking about just those who bow down before Buddha. I'm not just talking about the, those who bow before uh, some stone god or gold god or silver god. I'm talking about people who put other things before God. That is their idol. Maybe football, maybe baseball, maybe basketball. Maybe it's shopping. Maybe, maybe it's fishing. Maybe it's, maybe it's uh, a boat or a ski do, but, but they're more interested in entertainment than they are idolaters. They're all going to be in that place called hell. Hell is a place of vile association. None of that. And secondly, hell is a place of separation from the saints of all the ages. In Luke chapter 13 and verse 28, Jesus said, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I, I don't know whether you've ever been in a room where somebody was in so much pain that they were gnashing their teeth. I have, and it's an awful thing. 
the terribleness of hell is going to cause men to weep and gnash their teeth. He says, when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. That simply means that God is going to take the godly to heaven. And you're going to be separated from them forever and forever and forever for all eternity. A godly mother that prayed for you. She'll go to heaven and you'll go to hell. A godly father that prayed for you. He'll go to heaven and you'll go to hell. Maybe children that, 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 that they picked up on the bus and brought to church and they got concerned about your soul and prayed for you to be saved. They'll go to heaven and you'll go to hell. Preacher, what kind of place is this place called hell? It'll be a place of vile associations, a place of separating from all that's right and all that's good and all that's beautiful. Number three, hell is a place of eternal darkness. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, Peter said, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. In the little book of Jude, verse number 13, the Bible talks about the apostate who will go to hell. And it says of him, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. You, you hear people today make, make foolish statements about, I, well, I'm going to hell. My friends are all going. We're going to have a block party. D did you know what you don't understand is that hell is going to be a place where you'll hear things, but you won't see them because it is a place of blackness, of darkness. There'll be no light. Matthew 8 and verse 12, Jesus talking about those who are going to hell, says, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. And again, he uses that phrase, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I don't know how many years ago it's been now. It's been a number of years ago. It goes back to the time not long after Janet and I married, which has been a good long while ago. Uh, we, were, we were doing a 4th of July thing, you know, and, and didn't have money to go anywhere, so... We had a little extra money, but none to go anywhere. So we were doing some things around here. And I'd heard people talk about Ruby Falls, and, and that may be one of your favorite spots to go. I, I, we went, went down that elevator and walked over and saw, saw the, the, the falls and, and kind of disappointed me when I found out man had made all that. <laughs> Might have known, known man was behind all of it. About the only thing that really impressed me about Ruby Falls was when they cut the lights out. I've been in the darkness of night before, but I'd never been in darkness like that. I, I mean, I'm, the, the darkness was so thick that uh, you, you almost felt like you could take your hand and, and push it aside. Uh, that's nothing to be compared with the darkness of an eternal hell. What an awful fall. Think about it. Darkness, not just today, but tomorrow. That there be no light, that there be no light in hell forever. Never, think about it, never a morning. Ne never a sunrise where the darkness would fade away. If you've been where I have and been sick and, and been in the hospital with, with something going on that was so uncomfortable, I, I, there have been times in the wee hours of the morning I prayed, oh dear God, please let the morning come. Don't, please let this day, this night get over with. Finally the morning comes. But there will never be a morning in hell. The sun will never rise in the east. There will never be beautiful rays of sunlight trickling through the trees to come and, and warm your face. What an awful thought. Never a morning, never a sunrise. The night of darkness never to fade away. Evangelist Robert Sumner used to tell the story of a young man. He was about 14 to 15 years of age and being raised in an ungodly family. His mother had died as a result of wicked living, and he was being raised by an ungodly father. And the boy became very sick and, and was literally at the point of death. The family knew nothing about God and the Bible. The boy, the boy didn't know that, that the soul left the body at death and, and went either to heaven or to hell. 
And uh, he knew he was dying. He heard the doctor talking. He knew he was dying. And he was so afraid of the grave and, and the darkness that, that he knew would come as they placed his body in that coffin and put it in that, that uh, three by six uh, 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 grave and then they put the dirt on top of it. And he knew he'd be sealed in and there'd be darkness there forever and ever. And he was so afraid of that. That as he lay on his deathbed, he made his poor ignorant father to promise that he'd put a window in the top of his coffin. And that when they buried him, they, they would leave it open. They wouldn't put dirt there so that the, the, the sun could shine into his grave and touch his body. Dr. Sumner said the father kept his promise and fashioned that young man's coffin with that window at the top to allow the sun to shine into his casket. Please hear me, beloved. When you die without Christ, you'll go to a place where no friend, no family member can fashion a window that'll ever let light in to where you are. Hell is a place of utter darkness. It's a place of vile and wicked associations, a place of separation from all the saints of all ages, a place of eternal darkness. And then number four, hell is a place of eternal separation from God. Do you realize how, how blessed it is to be able to open the Word of God and then to sense the, the Spirit of God speaking to our hearts, moving upon our hearts, even if we're lost, to think about the wondrous thought that God would love us enough in our lostness to deal with our heart. Can I tell you this morning, spiritual death means separation. On the cross, the Lord Jesus took our separation. The Bible tells us how He was separated from God the Father as He took my sin and your sin on the cross. Mark 15 and verse 34 says, At the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lemai sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus took my sin. He took your sin, all of our sin. All, all, listen, all the sin in your life that you can think about. He took it, uh, uh, your unbelief, He took it to Calvary. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, He became sin for us who knew no sin. And when He became that sin, God the Father the Bible tells us who is of pure eyes than to look upon sin. God the Father could not look upon His Son because He had my sin and your sin and the sin of the world upon Him. And God turned His back on His Son. And that's why Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? In other words, He took all the hell that an unbelieving man should suffer in hell and suffered in his place at Calvary. He became my substitute and your substitute in hell, dying for us and, and suffering that separation from God. And in that period of time, I know you and I have a hard time wrapping our mind around that. He's God the Son. But I'm telling you, friend, on the cross, He became God the Son who was bearing my sin and your sin. And because of that, God turned His back on His only begotten Son. And I'm telling you this morning, listen to me. If you die in your unbelief and you go to hell, you're going to be separated eternally from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Listen to Paul's words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7, 8, and 9. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Now that'd be bad enough, but it doesn't end there. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. From what? From the presence of the Lord and the glory of His presence. 
You see, beloved, contrary to what some religionists would teach, death is not annihilation. If death was the end of it all, then why not eat, drink, and be merry? Because we die and that's the end of it. But death's not the end of it. Death is going to be the end of only one thing, and that's the tabernacle that you're living in. What you're living in is going to die unless Jesus comes and you're changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to die. And, and this thing, no matter what you do and pamper and pet it, try to make it pretty, no matter what you do to it, it's going to die. It's going to rot. It's going to pass away. But there, there is that real you, that eternal being that's on the inside. The, 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 the thing that matters most is not this body that you're living in, but it's what's on the inside. And what's on the inside, if you die without Christ, you're going to be separated from God for all eternity. That, that means you can never lift your voice and cry, God, would you help me? That, that means you'll never say, oh God, would you be merciful to me, a sinner? Would you save me? There'll be no, there'll be no salvation separated from the presence of God. Hell is a place of vile and wicked associations. It's a place of separation from the saints of all ages. It's a place of eternal darkness, a place of eternal separation from God. Number five, hell is a place of memory. I think about the many horrors of hell. And it's my judgment this morning that one of the most horrible things about hell will be memory. You see, when you die lost, you take your memory with you to that awful place called hell. Listen, listen to what Jesus said in the story of the rich man and Lazarus in, in, in Luke 16, 23. Jesus said to that unbelieving rich man, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime. I believe people who die lost will remember those things. Those times when someone witnessed to them about Jesus, somebody handed them a track and tried to convince them of their need of Christ, and they walked away. I, I believe they'll remember a mother's prayer, a daddy's prayer, a brother's prayer, a sister's prayer. I, 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 believe, that, I, I believe they'll remember being in a service like this, hearing a man of God stand and open God's Word and warn them about their need of Christ. They'll remember that time and how they walked away. I, I'm so thankful this morning for the wonderful memories that I have in this life. Sweet memories, wonderful memories. Can you imagine how horrible memory will be in hell for that one who had the opportunity in this life to trust Christ and they did not? I, I, don't, I don't mean just memory today, but a lingering memory. Think about it. I, I've had some tough things happen to me. And, and you know, you, you remember those things for a while. But after a little while, they kind of pass away. But I want to tell you, hell hell's going to be eternal. And that memory is going to be there today. And it's going to be there tomorrow. And it's going to be there the next day. And the day. I mean, all eternity. Knowing, knowing, knowing that you could have been saved. You could have been in heaven. But you're in eternal hell. What an awful place hell's going to be. Number six, hell's a place of hopelessness. Oh, I, I know, I, I know that uh, there are some religious people in this world who try to get you to believe that there is a place, it's kind of a, it's kind of a place between heaven and hell. They call it purgatory where... Where you, if you've done bad things, they're going to send you. And, and after God has an opportunity to work on you for a while there in purgatory, if you get enough people to give enough money and pray enough, they can get you out and you can go to heaven. But I want to tell you, there's no such place talked about in the Word of God. No, no such place. Hell will be a place of hopelessness. Listen to the words of our Lord in Revelation chapter 14, verses 10 and 11. As He speaks about those who are going to go to hell, He said, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God 
which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up, how long? Forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his image. I believe the saddest word in the English language is that word hopeless. I had not been pastoring but a few short months when I had a couple in my first church who called me one morning. Their little baby boy, cutest little boy you've ever put eyes on, had become very sick. They had rushed him to the hospital. The hospital there in the town where we were examined him and they said, we're going to have to send him to the hospital in Atlanta. The test here shows some things that we're very concerned about. And the mother and dad, of course, were about overcome with that. They transferred him by ambulance to the hospital in Atlanta. And I remember standing with that mother and dad as the doctor came and stood beside them, took each of them by the hand and said to them, I, and, and, his, and the doctor's heart was broken. He said to them, I, I wish I could tell you something different. But he said, all of our tests have come back and your baby has a type of leukemia that doesn't respond to any treatment that we know about today. And the mother looked and, and said to him, what can we, what can we look for? And the doctor drowned his head and he used this, these words. He said, outside of God, the situation is hopeless. I've stood by a wife in the hospital whose husband had had a serious, serious heart attack. And he was in a coma. And I've heard the doctor say to her, I'm sorry. But from a medical standpoint, the situation is hopeless. A terrible, it is a terrible, terrible word. But I'll tell you this morning, those situations, even though the world looks at it and says it's hopeless, they're in this world. And they're nothing to be compared to eternity. Because eternity is from now on. And when a person goes to hell, it is an absolute hopeless situation because there's no way out. There are no exit signs. There, there are no escape corridors. Proverbs 11 and verse 7 says, When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perisheth. Hell is a hopeless place. Not just for a day and a night or a week or a month, but on and on and on for the endless eternity. And then lastly, hell is a place of burning. And I, for a reason, left this one to last this morning because the world laughs at this. The world mocks at this. The world scoffs at this. And even the idea of hell, and, and especially when you talk about hell being a place of burning. I would simply remind you this morning that the Lord Jesus Christ, who was infinite in His love, had more to say about hellfire than any other preacher or prophet in the Word of God. In fact, Jesus had more to say about hellfire and hell than He even had to say about the place called heaven. In Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. Jesus said, Then shall He say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now I know, I know this morning, I, I've, I've heard them say this. That word everlasting does not really mean everlasting. Well, what I'll tell you this morning, the same word that talks about everlasting life is the word that's used here for everlasting fire. I have no reason to doubt that they don't mean the very same thing. Jesus in Mark 9, 43 said, If I hand offend thee, cut it off. For it's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell 
into the fire that shall never be quenched. I haven't counted them, but I am told that there are 70 texts in the New Testament alone that deal with the subject of hell and hell fire. And the majority of those texts come from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. I spent a few minutes this morning giving us a few verses that tell us what God's Word has to say about a place called hell. I would remind you this morning, and I'm done, I would remind you this morning that it's not God's will that anyone go to this awful place called hell. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says he's not willing that any should perish. That's not God's will for me and it's not God's will for you. And God provided a way whereby you and I could escape the torments of this place. And that way is found in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go to hell this morning, you're going to go over that cross that stood on Calvary's hill where the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, bled and died for my sins and yours. You have to step across that to go to this awful place called hell. I'll ask you this morning very simply, are you a part of the family of God? I don't mean you come to church. I appreciate you being here. I, I appreciate every person that comes into this building. I'm so glad they come. But you see, that's not the question. I'm not asking you, are, are you in church? Or even are you a member of the church? I'm asking you this this morning. Are you a part of the family of God? Have you been born again? Jesus said you must be born again. Five minutes after you die. Five seconds after you die. One second after you die. Where are you going to be? One or two places. You're going to be in heaven or you're going to be in hell. And it all depends on whether you reject or receive the Lord Jesus Christ. What do I need to do, preacher, in order to be saved? The Philippian jailer cried out to Paul and Silas, What must I do to be saved? Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they simply answered to him, as short a verse as you can find in the Bible and so concise telling you exactly what you need to do in order to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That jailer did that and he was gloriously saved. Not only was he saved, but his house was saved. His family was saved. Are you a part of the family of God this morning? If you are, that's good. That's wonderful. But I'll ask you to go along with that this morning. Is your family in? Is your family in? Do they know the Lord? I don't mean are they religious or, or do they believe some of the things in the Bible, but are they in? Have they truly trusted Christ? You see, the truth of this message ought to stir our hearts as God's people. If we're saved, it ought to stir our hearts to be a witness for the Lord. Do you care? Do you really care if a soul dies and goes to hell? Because that's what will happen unless they trust the Lord. Bow your head with me, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Miss Janet's coming to the piano. In just a minute, she'll begin a verse of an invitation song. And if you're in this room this morning, you don't know the Lord. I, I want to beg you to come this morning. There is but a step between me and death. You need to come this morning. Then if you're saved this morning, maybe you're not living for the Lord like you ought to. You ought to come this morning. Get that right with the Lord. Because you see, all around you, there are folks watching your life. You are, you, by the way you are living, you are leading someone to the Lord or away from the Lord as a Christian. You need to come get that right with the Lord this morning. Tell him about it. Tell him. Don't tell me. Tell him about it because he's the one that will have to cleanse and forgive you and help you to overcome that. Then you may be here this morning, God's wrestling, wrestling with you about decisions you need to make in your life. Maybe the Lord said to you, hey, you know what? This is a good place to serve the Lord right here in this church. And you ought to become a member of the church. You, you, you ought to, you ought to, you're saved, you're going to heaven. You ought to become a part of the work of the Lord here. 
So you can feel like I, this is my family. This is my family that I'm serving the Lord with. Then I want to encourage you to do that this morning. Lord, thank you for your word. Help us now in these moments of invitation to mind you, to be obedient as you've spoken to our heart. Meet needs, Lord, in lives, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me quietly, heads bowed, eyes closed for just a moment? You obey.